I'd like to welcome you to the uh, ninth annual uh, University of Wisconsin Department of Medicine Research Day. Um, we've got a full day and uh, really it reflects the, both the depth and the breadth of the uh, research going on in the Department of Medicine. We had, over, we had 107 abstracts submitted, 106 of them uh, for a display or a poster display or talk, uh, divided fairly uh, evenly between base, uh, basic translational and uh, clinical uh, presentations. And we have uh, participation of the 10 divisions and uh, along with CTRI um, uh, in the uh, uh, in in the presentations today, so really uh, uh, something for everybody. We hope. Um, I'd like to first of all thank the uh, planning committee, um, uh, who are all listed here, and uh, and including uh, Nazia Saftar, who's the, our uh, uh, research committee chair, uh, and. Um, most of all, I'd like to thank Betty Weiss because she does all the heavy lifting here. I am certainly just a figurehead. <laughs> so um, just to review the day, um, our, our first speaker, Dr. D'Alessio, will be uh, from Duke University, will be uh, uh, introduced in a, a few minutes by Dr. Page. Um, following the grand round speaker, um, we will have uh, the uh, 15-minute talks, uh, uh, which will be moderated by Kara Goss. And uh, again, we have a, a, a broad range of things from uh, carotid artery disease to PTLD to eosinophil activation and asthma, uh, outcome research, and even uh, evaluating grant uh, uh, critiques. So ver a very broad range of, of uh, uh, types of research uh, represented here. Um, we do have two uh, changes this year. Um, we are introducing uh, mini talks or TED talks, uh, which will be moderated by uh, Miriam Shalif, and this is, will give some of our younger uh, trainees and junior faculty opportunities to uh, present in a rapid fashion. These will be three-minute talks with uh, uh, one or two questions to follow, and Miriam will move that along. Um, and uh, there'll be eight, eight total talks there. Uh, and then following that, we will have lunch, which is going to be outside, uh, catered by Blue Fees. And this is your last chance to have Blue Fees because they're closed. So <laughs> uh, they will reopen in another form, apparently. Um, then uh, following lunch, we will have uh, our own uh, Craig January uh, present on inherited arrhythmia syndromes, uh, uh, and uh, we're very happy to have him uh, here today. Uh, and the poster session will follow. So that's the second change we've consolidated into one poster session. We're serving dessert, so get some dessert, wander around the posters, talk to the presenters. Uh, I think you'll find there is something for everybody out there. Uh, in the afternoon, we will have another uh, oral presentation session, 15-minute uh, presentations. Greg Gautier will uh, moderate that. And then finally, at 4 o'clock, uh, uh, Dr. Page and I will give out the award presentations for best uh, uh, clinical and best ba basic uh, research. Um, so uh, without further ado, I will let Dr. Page introduce our speaker. Thank you very much, um, John, and, and first of all, I want to welcome everyone.
objective not because we're nice, not because we work hard, but because of the quality of the science that's being done, the ideas that are being put forward, and the efforts on behalf of the faculty. So, so congratulations, frankly, to all of us for the accomplishment and for the ongoing work. And today we'll get to hear about the, the fruit of the labor of the uh, efforts in the Department of Medicine. So let me shift gears and, and introduce our visiting professor uh, today, and who's going to kick off our uh, Department of Medicine research day. Uh, David D'Alessio was born in New York, but he's from around here, and actually has family uh, from Madison visiting with us today. Uh, he's a graduate of Carleton College, and then came to University of Wisconsin for his medical degree. He then went on to for residency at Temple University, a year of research at Temple, and then was a research fellow at the University of Washington where they recognized his talent and recruited him onto the faculty, ascending through the rank of asso assistant professor at the University of Washington. But in 1999, the University of Cincinnati recruited him to become associate professor. He went up through the ranks there to professor and director of the Division of Endocrinology at the University of Cincinnati when in 2014 he was recruited by my alma mater, Duke, to uh, uh, become the director of the Division of Endocrinology, and he is, holds the rank of professor and is associate director of the Duke Molecular Physiology Institute. He's very well published in high impact journals, 160 uh, articles that I counted. Uh, I always like to see how, how luminaries get their start and how they found their direction. His very first paper was a reappraisal of the caloric requirements of men. His second paper was on the thermic effects of food in lean and obese men. And just fast forward 158 more papers, most recently EPUB ahead of press is the American Journal of Physiology, Endocrinology and Metabolism, uh, the uh, increasing effects in obese adolescents <coughs> with and without type 2 diabetes impaired or intact. So, Clearly, an area of focus early on, and one that he's pursued to international acclaim. He also is uh, author of eight book chapters and 45 editorials and reviews. He's been very well funded throughout his career, currently PI on an R01 and a VA Merit Award, as well as co-investigator on two other R01s. He's been a very good citizen nationally, contributing at leadership levels to the American Federation for Medical Research, the American Diabetes Association, and the Endocrine Society. He's also served as a generous grant reviewer for the AHA, the VA, the NIH, and the American Diabetes Association. In terms of editorial service, he's associate editor of, of the Journal of Investigative Medicine and has been uh, issue direct uh, editor for the current opinion in clinical nutrition and metabolic care and is on the editorial board of five other journals. He's received a number of honors throughout his career, including being elected to Western Society for Clinical Investigation. He received the Paul Deason Award for Clinical Teaching at the University of Washington. I can say it's one of the highest honors at that institution. And he held the Bonk Chair for Diabetes Research at the University of Cincinnati. He's lectured broadly, and we're really fortunate to have really an alum come home to, uh, to Wisconsin to provide uh, his uh, keynote address today is GLP-1 a hormone, whether and when. So please join me in, in welcoming Dr. D'Alessio. Thanks very much. Thanks, <clears throat> well, thanks, thanks for that um, uh, really generous uh, introduction, Rick. I'd, I'd actually forgotten that a lot of that stuff happened, but uh, nice to be reminded. Um, I, I, my class was the first class to come to what we called the, the Big Brown Hospital, or the Death Star. Uh, Star Wars vernacular is one thing that's carried over from the 80s to now, probably. Uh, I think I, I didn't work here very much. Um, we, we tried to do all our rotations at the VA. The cafeteria there had a deep fryer. And you could go down in the morning after rounds for surgery or before rounds for medicine and get hot, fresh donuts. Uh, a temptation that uh, uh, was was well worth doing all your rotations at the VA. Um, so it's it's truly a pleasure to be to be back uh, at the UW. I haven't been on this campus since I graduated on the medical campus. 
Um, I'd like to thank the organizing committee, one, for inviting me, two, for just a splendid dinner last night. It was really a sort of a warm, fun uh, group, and we had a lot of conversation, a lot of laughs. So what I'm going to talk to you today about um, is a, uh, a story about endocrinology and diabetes therapeutics. I'm going to focus on this peptide, glucagon-like peptide 1, which is something our lab's worked on for a long time. Um, talk about its place in medicine, but also um, how a successful bench-to-bedside story um, still needs more investigation. So I, I structured my remarks this way. I'll talk about what I think is the conventional model of GLP-1 action, actually explain to you, a lot of you, what GLP-1 is, and talk about problems with this. And then I'll suggest some current views and why, why it's important to keep studying uh, this gut hormone. So <clears throat> it's been known for a long time that when you eat, take carbohydrate in through the gut, you secrete a lot of insulin, a lot more than if you give uh, glucose by vein. So this is an, an early study. This is 1964. This is right after the radioaminoassay is developed and for the first time we can measure insulin. And you see here a group of volunteers that drink glucose or get an equivalent amount of glucose IV. And the blood sugar levels are about the same, but when they drink glucose, there's about a two- or three-fold rise in insulin. And the natural inference from this is, well, the intestine must be making something that's released after meals that stimulates insulin secretion. And this set off a search for these factors called incretin, an old physiologic term for an endogenous substance that's substances that stimulate insulin. And, you know, uh, bind and grind studies using porcine intestine in the 70s found a factor called GIP that had all the features of an incretin. About 10 years later, when science had advanced to cloning genes, the proglucagon gene was cloned from another group of endocrine cells in the gut. And these made a peptide that was like, looked like the pancreatic hormone glucagon. Uh, and so they called it glucagon-like peptide 1. And the, to these, these two peptides uh, account for almost all of this effect that we see here. And the, the remarkable thing, and a, a figure I always go back to when I, I just want to think about the 30,000-foot view, is that you can give a healthy human 50 grams, 75, 100, 120 grams of glucose. Um, this in between here is what you get in a 16-ounce cola. And your blood sugar will go up about the same amount. That is, we regulate... Uh, we regulate our blood sugar very tightly, um, and it doesn't matter how much carbohydrate comes in. We never let that homeostasis change. And this is because at a small dose of glucose, you get a small insulin response. At a medium dose, you get a medium response. And at a high dose, you get a high response. So the qu question is, glucose itself can't account for this stimulation of the beta cell. It has to be glucose in conjunction with other things. And it's these gut hormones that set the gain on insulin secretion allow it to be appropriate for the meal size, and maintain control of blood sugar. So for this to be true, of course, the gut hormones, the incretins, ought to be secreted um, after you eat, and they are. This is GLP-1 and GIP after a fat or a protein meal or after water, and nothing happens then. But so the incretins come up when we eat. They come up in proportion to meal size. This is subjects eating a small breakfast or a large breakfast, and you can see the proportion of incretins varies. And you can see that during the day, um, with supper, the incretins are high. They go to almost unmeasurable levels at night. Uh, when we're not eating, when we don't have food coming in through the gut, you don't need the stimulus. And then they go back up uh, when we eat during the day. So that part of the physiology sort of makes sense. Um, the anatomy of the GI endocrine system is interesting, and I think probably underappreciated. Most of us didn't learn about that in medical school in the 80s. It, it may be taught a little bit now. But, of course, the, the gut has, this, has these, the, as their ultimate surface area, these finger-like villi of single cells, uh, epithelial cells that absorb carbohydrate and fat and amino acids, etc. And then scattered through them, represented here in brown, are endocrine cells endocrine cells, about every hundredth cell. And they're, they're divided into a number of cell types. They make different hormones. They have different distributions through the gut. And despite the fact that they're a, a decided uh, minority in the, in the epithelium of the gut, you know, there's 36 feet of small bowel, and there's, you know, a few thousand uh, endocrine cells. So the gut is actually the biggest endocrine organ in the body. 
If you look at a gut endocrine cell, and you see one here wedged between two sort of workaday enterocytes, these are absorptive cells, the enterendocrine cell has a, uh, a luminal tongue, essentially, some projections that can sample passing chyme, nutrients, bile acids, bacterial products. Um, and then at the base, secretory granules full of hormones, whatever hormone that cell makes. And these can be released to the submucosa, the interstitium where they can travel through capillaries, interact with uh, 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 submucosal nerves, and, and mediate their effects. And this is basically how we think the system works. So I talked about GLP-1 being uh, uh, discovered through gene cloning, and this is, this is that description. Proglucagon is the pro-hormone. It's made by the proglucagon gene. This was the hormone that was much known. Glucagon's been known since the 1920s. But when the whole sequence here was, was uh, identified, there were two other looked like peptide sequences, and they're GLP-1 and GLP-2. And again, the, the book says that the only cells in a body that make proglucagon are alpha cells in the pancreas, neurons in the hindbrain, and enteroendocrine cells. And moreover, that these different cell types process uh, proglucagon in a different way, depending on whether they express primarily protein uh, convertase 2 or protein convertase 1, 3, such that the brain and the gut make predominantly GLP-1 and no free glucagon. And the alpha cells of the pancreas make glucagon and no free GLP-1. This is a neat cartoon. It's been published over and over again. And it's probably wrong uh, because, of course, biology is never quite so binary as this. Uh, and, and there is now accumulating evidence that the alpha cell can do some of this processing and at least the gut can do some of this processing. But again, for a working model, this is mostly accurate. So again, for GLP-1 to be an incretin, stimulate insulin secretion, should have a receptor. Receptor should be on beta cells. And in fact, the GLP-1 receptor was cloned from a beta cell library. It's a family B G protein coupled receptor with all of the classic features of that uh, class of receptor. Uh, and the hallmark is that it stimulates a rise in cyclic AMP, and that seems to be tied to a lot of its downstream effects. Beside the beta cell, the GLP-1 receptor is expressed in the heart and the vasculature, and there's a very interesting emerging biology here, um, as it looks like some, of the, some drugs based on GLP-1 signaling may have benefits for cardiovascular health. It's expressed in the brain and the peripheral nervous system, and this is something we've been interested in. Uh, GIP has also got a receptor, and the GIP and GLP-1 receptors are very specific. They don't, they're ligand-specific, don't talk to each other. But it, it has features uh, of a G-protein-coupled receptor as well. So this was the, the paper. I was a second-year fellow in Seattle. I'd been put in a lab that studied uh, gut hormones. I had been studying energy metabolism at Temple. I didn't know what the hell was going on. We were studying some peptides that were interesting, but I was worried weren't going to go anywhere, and they weren't tied to disease. And this paper came out, uh, and my mentor, John Ensink, I remember him walking into the little cubicle I sat in, and he threw it on my desk. He said, you should look at this. This might be interesting to study. So this was the first demonstration that GLP-1 is active in humans. This is a, a, a proof of concept study. Um, as so many were done, British medical students were the subjects. Um, easily swayed into volunteering, I guess. And these people were given either an infusion of GLP or GIP during a glucose tolerance test. And you can see the blood sugar goes up and comes down. But here's insulin secretion with glucose alone. It doubles when you give glucose plus GIP, and then it quadruples when you give GLP-1. So this observation that the, that the body made a substance and had a natural receptor system that could mediate you know, a four-fold amplification of insulin secretion sort of set off a lot of lights. Um, and uh, this then uh, became a, a really active area of research. And when I, the gut hormone meetings at the ADA would be one session, 20 people. You know, it's like exchanging Christmas cards. How you doing? Same people every year. Uh, and now you go to the meetings, and there's five sessions, and there's thousands of people. So this has been a real shift in endocrinology. So there's a number of loss of function studies that demonstrate that GLP-1 is essential for physiology. Uh, and the hallmark is a knockout mouse made by Dan Drucker, 1996, and published some 400 times now. But you can see these are control mice. This is their response. 
If you give them glucose, the blood sugar goes up, and then they clear glucose. And if they don't have a GLP-1 receptor, they don't do it as well. They have impaired glucose tolerance. You need GLP to, to nor have normal homeostasis. If you do this in humans, uh, this is a group of British medical students again. This is normal glucose tolerance. You can give them a GLP-1 receptor antagonist, block the effects of GLP-1, and you do the same thing. You induce glucose intolerance. Now, one of the issues with this is, you know, we assumed this, that, that the glucose intolerance here was because they weren't secreting enough insulin. Um, but in fact, in, in this paper, the insulin levels were higher in, in the in the GLP-1 blockade, and that's because they chased up the blood sugar. It was hard to sort that out. So to get around this and, and look and see how much of postprandial insulin secretion is dependent on GLP-1, we devised this paradigm where we didn't let glucose change. So we would bring in subjects, give them an infusion of glucose to raise their blood sugar about to the maximum of what you'd get during an oral glucose tolerance test. Then we'd give them an oral glucose drink and adjust our insulin infusion so glucose stayed fixed. This is, allows us to measure insulin secretion from glucose alone and glucose plus the incretins because when you drink glucose, GLP and GIP go up. And then we repeat this study with an infusion of the GLP blocker. And from this, we can deduce the GLP-1 effect. And this is what we see. Um, so this is fasting insulin levels in this group. It goes up about three or four fold with glucose alone. But you can see this huge rise in insulin secretion when you combine hyperglycemia with stimulatory factors from the gut. And this really demonstrates this red line here, the potency of the incretin effect. Now, when we repeat this study and block GLP-1, we knock down insulin secretion 30 to 40%. Um, and we've done this study now in lean, healthy subjects, in middle-aged obese subjects, and in type 2 diabetic subjects. And we find the same thing. It's about 30% in all subjects. Diabetic patients have crummy insulin secretion, but a third of it is still accounted for by GLP-1. So physiologically, again, this makes sense. This fits with the models of the incretin system. And, and I will tell you that, that incretin biology, particular G, particularly GLP-1, has been the, the dominant uh, drug development in diabetes in the last 15 years. There's now five different GLP-1 agonists that we can treat diabetic patients with, and a host of pills that work to increase endogenous GLP-1 levels. And, and so this has been, this is a, a, a model drug development program targeted uh, not fortuitous discovery of, of effective diabetes drugs. Um, and, uh, you know, arguably has been a big bench to bedside success. So the conventional model of GLP-1 action, what I used to teach in the medical school at Seattle and, and, and Cincinnati, was that GLP-1 is made in the gut it's secreted after meals into the portal vein. It burbles through the liver, out to the right side of the heart, into the lung, back to the left side of the heart, and out to the arterial circulation where it can interact with receptors on beta cells. This is classic endocrinology. A factor made at one site that goes through the blood to interact with factors at the other site. Now, this model, I can tell you, um, is most certainly incorrect. Um, and I'm going to show you uh, some evidence as to why I think that and why most GLP-1-ologists um, think that this conventional model of endocrine action of GLP-1 uh, doesn't occur very much. So these are the main reasons, that the levels are relatively low, that it's re really metabolized and inactivated quickly, and that the actions uh, of the peptide, actions of GLP-1 signaling, can be demonstrated even when uh, plasma levels are very low. So how does this go? Well, this is the figure I showed you before, right? Small breakfast, big breakfast, look at the GLP-1 in proportion, there's GIP. The dirty little secret, of course, is when we plot GLP-1 levels, we really truncate the y-axis to make it look like a response. If you plot GIP and GLP-1 on the same axis in molar equivalence, this is what you get. GIP goes up about 10, 15 fold. I mean, this is, and it lasts for a long time. This is the behavior of a proper hormone big dynamic range that lasts in the circulation for time. This is what GLP looks like in this same curve. This is, you know, barely changing, 1.5. This looks like what my neuroscience colleagues call neural spillover. Just a little bit extra dribbles out from the tissue where the, where the uh, neural signaling goes on. And so this does not look like uh, typical hormonal action. 
The other thing is that GLP-1 is metabolized, and it's, it's almost like it's the genie in the bottle that the body has adapted to control very tightly. There is a serine peptidase, dipeptidyl peptidase 4. It's an ectoenzyme, if you can imagine this being the plasma membrane of endothelial cells, capillary endothelial cells, with this enzyme sort of hanging off into the circulation. And it, it binds passing peptides that have particular protein signatures. And it is very avid for GLP-1, such that GLP-1 passing through a capillary is quickly uh, uh, grabbed and metabolized. And the half-life of GLP-1 in the circulation of a human is about a minute. So it doesn't hang around very long. And again, that challenges how we think of hormones as acting, because we don't think about secreting them into the blood and rapidly inactivating them. So <clears throat> there are some studies that have tried to estimate the significance of this rate of metabolism. This, this was done uh, in, in pigs, where you can put catheters in the portal vein and the hepatic vein and, and the arterial circulation and actually calculate how fast GLP is being metabolized. And what they found in this study was that only 25% of GLP that was reaching the liver was active, um, that most of it had been metabolized. And the liver is full of DPP-4, and the lung is full of DPP-4. So when you talk about the gauntlet that, that a, an innocent GLP molecule has to run from the gut to the beta cell, it's pretty daunting. And uh, in fact, it's probably minimal amounts are, are actually getting through uh, unmetabolized. Mostly what we measure in the blood is this truncated form, GLP-1, 9 to 36. It loses the first two amino acids, which it turns out are essential for activating the receptor. Um, one question that was raised early on is, since most of it's this metabolite, maybe the metabolite's the active substance. And my, my colleague Torsten Fall did these studies. He gave uh, either saline GLP-1 or the metabolite to healthy humans during a glucose tolerance test. And you can see here, this is insulin secretion in response to glucose alone. You add GLP-1, you get this big amplification, as we've seen before. And the metabolite, given it five-fold excess here to account for the difference in the circulation, is inactive. So again, the metabolism seems to be, one, rapid, and two, uh, inactivating with regard to insulin secretion. This is demonstrated in a study here, um, uh, in another British study. These are diabetic subjects. They're, they have fasting hyperglycemia. Uh, about 180 milligrams per DL overnight. They get very hyperglycemic when they eat breakfast and lunch. Here's your controls with blood sugars around 90 and better glucose tolerance. If you hook these diabetic subjects up to an IV and just run in GLP-1 overnight, they drop their blood sugars to levels that are really uh, uh, indistinguishable from the controls. On the other hand, if you repeat the study, give them GLP-1 overnight and turn it off just before breakfast, everything breaks down they get just as hyperglycemic as they were because the GLP-1 is cleared so quickly, the effect is gone. So these were very influential studies in a sense that they showed the potency of GLP-1, actually normalizing blood sugar, but also the, um, the, all the limitations of using the native peptide uh, for therapeutics. Now, the, the last point is a subtle point about damning GLP-1 as a hormone, but it's, it's something that we stumbled upon and I, I can't figure out and don't have any other explanation uh, except what I'm going to tell you now. So in our studies where we raise the blood sugar, we feed glucose, we keep the glucose the same, and then we block GLP-1, this is what we see, right? So GLP-1 normally, and we block it down by 30% with Xenin-4, and this all looks fine. What about this? Here's, this, here's GLP-1 block and insulin secretion even before we feed them. So these are, this is in the fasting state. GLP-1 levels are not measurable by our conventional means. And still we see that when you antagonize it, you drop the blood sugar by, uh, the insulin secretion by about 30%, right? So that there is a fasting GLP-1 effect that we can unmask with this antagonist. And it's about as big an effect as the secreted one. So it seems that having secreted peptide, having GLP-1 around may not make any difference. Um, the other interesting thing is when we looked at this fasting GLP-1 effect, that is how much we could dampen insulin secretion um, in somebody that, was, that had a 14-hour fast, it's small in lean people, increases in people that are ex-obese or have had a gastric bypass. It's pretty high in obese people, and it's very high in diabetic people. So it, it speaks to uh, does GLP-1 
not circulating GLP-1, GLP-1 at some other source, maybe in the islet, maybe in the brain, compensate for beta cell dysfunction because, of course, across here you have good beta cell function, bad beta cell function. And this is something that we're actively looking at. So we get these data. We're, we're wondering, is it possible that GLP-1 is not a hormone? I'm telling you that definitively now, but, but that was before we started these studies. And our, our sense is we need to do a pretty definitive study to demonstrate this. And mouse genetics have limitations, but for pharmacology and definitive yes-no answers, it's a pretty good system. And so we decided we would remove the GLP-1 receptor from beta cells, thinking that if you don't, if you can't, if you don't have the endpoint of endocrine signaling, you ought to see a, a defect if, if it's, in fact, a, a hormone. And so... So we rigged up a, a mouse to do this. We put LOX P sites around a key region of the GLP-1 receptor. If this is a cartoon of a seven uh, uh, transmembrane domain receptor, we knocked out the first two and a half uh, uh, transmembrane domains. This intra-domain uh, uh, loop is very important for binding GLP-1. So we thought we had an inactive molecule. And in fact, you can see that here. In a global knockout, mice that had no GLP-1 receptors um, they didn't respond. Their blood sugar didn't go down at all when we gave them GLP-1 compared to a control group who gets a really nice response, much lower glucose. You can give a wild-type animal a shot of GLP-1 in the brain, and it'll stop eating, but our knockouts did not. So we thought, we had, we thought the, the, the receptor was well knocked out, but we just wanted to knock it out of the beta cell. So we crossed the flox mice with a, a, a mouse that expressed Cre recombinase and would cleave that portion of the, of the gene, uh, in a time and tissue specific manner. So this is a Cree that's driven by the mouse insulin promoter, so only beta cells, and it's activated by uh, uh, tamoxifen, so you can not do the knockout whenever you want. And in fact, we, we showed that, that um, when we gave tamoxifen, we could activate, in this case, a reporter, so that's on. When we don't give tamoxifen, it's quiet. So it looked like the tissues, the conditional knockout part worked, and so we knocked out the GLP-1 receptor from beta cells. And this is what we found. So over here, I'm showing you global knockouts, animals like the ones Drucker had published for a long time. And then there are beta cell knockouts. So if you knock out all the GLP-1 receptors in a mouse, they become glucose intolerant, whether you give them oral glucose or IP glucose. Again, IP glucose is like we give IV in humans. It doesn't stimulate incretin secretion. It's just hyperglycemia alone. Well, so then we did our definitive test. We figured during oral glucose, GLP ought to go up. If GLP has to bind, GLP in the circulation has to bind the receptor on beta cells to do all the business, they, those animals ought to be glucose intolerant, and they weren't. Um, the uh, poor postdoc who was doing this experiment thought he had gotten it wrong, so he did this three different times before he showed me the data, and he said, there's something wrong with our mouse. Um, and <clears throat> I was a little worried about that. And we, you know, when you do these GTTs in, in mice, you pick them up and you put a tube down their throat and you squirt in glucose. We thought, well, maybe we're stressing the poor beasts out and they're, 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 you know, that's confounding our results. So we taught them how to do a glucose tolerance test themselves. You can, teaching a mouse to drink chocolate Ensure is like teaching a kid to eat M&Ms. You just sort of give them a few M&Ms and they, they've learned. So, so we did that experiment. We just hung chocolate Ensure on the mouse cage and didn't matter whether you had a GLP-1 receptor or not. So to, to our way of thinking, these, this experiment showed either we had a, a mouse that wasn't what we thought it was, or um, the GLP-1 didn't act as a hormone. So we went back and looked again. Well, it turned out we did have a phenotype. When we gave IP glucose, our beta cell knockouts were quite glucose intolerant. And we couldn't explain this, right, because GLP-1 was unmeasurable at this time. But it, you really, a mouse needs a GLP-1 receptor on his beta cell to control hyperglycemia. And in fact, these animals had fasting hyperglycemia too. So they were abnormal, just not in the way we expected. Well, so we went one step further. We thought, well, if the beta cell receptor doesn't seem to be important for oral glucose tolerance, maybe there's other GLP-1 receptors that, that are. So these are the animals with an intact GLP-1 receptor. This is their glucose tolerance. You give them the GLP blocker, and they get glucose intolerant, right? So this tells you, yeah, this is what everybody shows. If we take the mice with no beta cell GLP-1 receptors, and we, and we give the antagonist, they get glucose intolerant too, suggesting that it's not the beta cell GLP-1 receptors that are controlling blood sugar. It's 
GLP-1 receptors at another site. Uh, and this, again, uh, really raises doubt about the conventional model of GLP-1 into the circulation, to the beta cell, and all the action. So if we summarize the effects of this knockout study, OGTs are normal, but they can be impaired by blocking other GLP-1 receptors. Um, but you need beta cell GLP-1 receptors to have a normal response to hyperglycemia and to control fasting glucose. So our inferences from these studies was that the, the incretin effect, normal control, normal insulin secretion, and control of postprandial glucose is not mediated by circulating GLP-1, or at least it's non-beta cell GLP-1 receptors. The reality is oral glucose tolerance is a multi-splendored, multi-layered homeostatic response. There's neural signals from the brain that start as soon as you smell the food, taste the food, swallow the food. There's GIP, GLP, and probably other factors. So that in a complex system like that, you take away one factor and it doesn't make a hell of a lot of difference. On the other hand, to respond to hyperglycemia is all a beta cell autonomous effect. And it seems that you need the GLP-1 receptor to make that happen normally. But again, we thought these data, um, in a, in a pretty convincing way, demonstrated that circulating GLP-1, that is the levels that purportedly go up and down when we eat, has a limited impact on insulin secretion and glucose metabolism. So um, just to, to put a twist on this, we said, well, we got these mice. They're pretty cool. Let's take some of the drugs that are available um, uh, on the market used for diabetic subjects and see if they need a beta cell GLP-1 receptor. So here we give... Uh, our knockout or control mice, loraglutide. It's a drug we use to treat diabetic patients. It's a once-a-day injection of a GLP agonist. And you can see here in red, the control animals have, this is their glucose tolerance, but they get a beautiful response, darn near a flattening of their glucose. The knockouts get about a half response, right? So it tells you that the beta cell, that there's some hormonal effect here. The beta cells are necessary to an extent, uh, but there's other, other beta cell or other receptors that, that can mediate this, this effect. If we give a drug, a pill, that inhibits uh, GLP-1 metabolism, a DPP-4 inhibitor, they're very commonly used now too in medicine, they work very nicely to lower blood sugar, but it doesn't make any difference whether you have a beta cell GLP-1 receptor or not. And these things are, are purported to increase a hormonal signal. If you look at the glossy pamphlets you get from the uh, uh, drug detail guys, they always have this endocrine model that you're amplifying. Well, this, this data here suggests that's not the case. <clears throat> so, since I've, you know, it's no fun to just damn a hypothesis and, and not give you some hope or an alternative or a, a punchline. So I'm going to try and give you a, a couple of punchlines, but I'll say at the beginning, this is work in progress. Um, the field has shifted, and for the last six, eight years, people are scrambling to account for the kinds of fundings I've just described and, and come up with alternative mechanisms of GLP-1 action. So two we've worked on are what I call the neural hypothesis and the paracrine hypothesis. So the neural hypothesis is this. I told you that GLP-1 receptors are expressed in nerve cells. And it turns out that one group of nerve cells that expresses this receptor are located in the nodose ganglia, which is a little ganglia right behind your mastoid. And these nerve cells are the sensory nerves that go to the viscera. So these are what sense visceral pain, uh, changes in heart rate, uh, changes in pulmonary function, all these things. They're contained in the vagus nerve, and they innervate the, you know, starting at the tongue, the lungs, the heart, but the stomach, uh, the portal vein, and the intestine. And when we, it took us a long time bunch of endocrinologists trying to find the nodose ganglion in a rat. But after many rats, we found it. And we took it out, and we looked, and there was the GLP-1 receptor expressed almost in as high levels as it was in the islet. And it doesn't show up in this light, but we, we posited, boy, the portal vein would be a great place to put a GLP-1 receptor, because you could integrate everything that was coming out of the gut. And there was some evidence that that might be the case. So we, we took out the portal vein, we sectioned it. Uh, this is like looking down a rigatoni and it's cut in little slices like that. And this would be the lumen of the portal vein, and this would be the wall. So you can see stained here in green are neural fibers. Stained in red are GLP-1 receptors. And when you overlap, and what it looked like was neural fibers expressed the GLP-1 receptor. Well, that was cool. And what we did then was we infused rats with either saline in their portal vein or GLP-1, or we gave GLP-1 not in the portal vein, but in the jugular vein. Then we looked in the hindbrain, 
where this is the first relay for these visceral sensory nerves and just saw if we activated the brain. So there's a couple of neurons turned on by saline, but a lot more turned on by GLP-1, and very few if you gave GLP-1 in the jugular vein. So again, this fit with this neuroanatomical model of portal sensing of GLP-1. We actually blocked GLP-1 in the portal vein and made the animals glucose intolerant. And a number of other groups had demonstrated this in other models, dog models mostly. And so this looked like a plausible alternative to, a, to an endocrine model. In follow-up studies, we couldn't show that portal GLP-1 had any effect on insulin secretion. So while I think it may be part of the control of blood glucose, and maybe these may be some of those extra beta cell GLP-1 receptors, um, we stopped working on this particular model because we're very interested in insulin secretion. Well, <clears throat> the alternative presents itself here. And that is those same visceral nerves that go to the portal vein continue right on down to the gut. And you can see here, these are villi in the upper intestine. And these purple lines here are neurons. This is an up-close view. And now you can see much better this uh, network of neurons that are right under the, the single cell epithelium. And here's a GLP-1 cell stained right next to one of these submucosal neurons. And this, this is a kind of an appealing thing. Um, this isn't like going from Jersey City to Omaha. This is like going from Madison to Middleton, right? They're very close together. This might be a plausible way to, uh, to, to set up signaling. Uh, Diego Borges in the Department of GI at uh, Duke did a beautiful paper a couple years ago. And he shows, if you look at a photomicrograph here of a GLP-1 cell, and then look at these neurons that are coursing beneath it, they're in very close apposition, and he calls this a pseudosynapse. You can see on uh, high-power microscopy that the GLP-1 cell really abuts right against these neurons. Um, and in fact, if you culture neurons and GLP-1 cells together, they find each other and form this, this pseudosynapse. So um, another plausible model on an anatomic basis. It's been very, very hard to test because, um, again, how do you activate GLP-1 receptors in the gut, all 36 feet, without doing other kinds of things. Um, the model suggests then that GLP-1 is secreted into the submucosa. It activates these visceral nerves. You have a reflex through the hindbrain and maybe the hypothalamus that goes out to the various target tissues that GLP-1 activates. Um, the problem has been given GLP-1 so that it gets across the gut. If you just put GLP-1 in the stomach or the intestine, not much happens. Um, we tried two tricks that we got from the pharmacology literature. One was to surround GLP-1 with a short-chain fatty acid, uh, which makes it lipophilic and allows it potentially to slip across the membrane. The other thing is we co-opted the multivitamin transporter in the gut, the transporter that moves B vitamins again, by hitching GLP-1 to biotin and seeing if that would drag it across. And in fact, both of these things worked. Um, this is GLP-1 levels in a, in a rat given saline or, or GLP-1, and these are probably noise in the assay. But if you cover it with a, uh, a short-chain fatty acid, you can get the levels to go up really high. And we saw the same thing with biotinylated. Um, if you then take mice and treat them with these compounds, this is their normal glucose tolerance here in black. This is with just bare-naked GLP-1 given into the gut. Not much happens. And then if you give uh, this, the short-chain fatty acid in two doses, you can all of a sudden see the glucose come down. And you see the same thing with the biotin. This is IPGLP1, which has a big effect. And this is biotinylated compared to control. So these are preliminary findings. There's work to be done here. And we think we can tease some of this out with some of our mouse models. But it looks like it's plausible. If you give GLP1 that gets across the gut, you can have effects. Now, whether those are effects are mediated by these nerves or not is, is not known. But that's sort of where the field is now in this area. <clears throat> so what's the other alternative? The other alternative is what I call the paracrine hypothesis. And that takes, that takes off from some of what I said about proglucagon processing. That, that it, the old model was the alpha cell only made glucagon and the enterocytes only made GLP-1. Well, now there's an emerging story with alpha cells making glucagon and GLP-1. It looks like they can make both... And in fact, alpha cells sit right next to beta cells. So you could posit that alpha cell GLP-1 production is right there where it can interact with the GLP-1 receptor and mediate effects, like the response to hyperglycemia, et cetera. So both rat and human islets make GLP-1. 
This is a, a rad islet here. You can see these are all insulin, stains in, insulin staining cells in green. And on the rim here are alpha cells that stain for GLP-1. You can culture these cells and measure both glucagon and GLP-1 in the medium. Uh, more impressively to me, human islets isolated from organ donors um, make glucagon and GLP-1. And it's not at 10,000 to 1 ratios. This looks like about 1 to 10, uh, 1 to 8, so in pretty good proportion. If you take these islets and you subject them to hyperglycemia, of course, you suppress glucagon, but GLP-1 seems to go up. And diabetic patients um, do the same thing. They have GLP-1 and it goes up. So this is plausible, I think, that alpha cell GLP-1 could be the regulatory factor. And in fact, could explain some of our findings in humans where we're blocking GLP-1 effects in the absence of circulating GLP-1. It may be what we're blocking is GLP-1 right here in the islet. So this is a, a complicated slide that I'm going to try and walk you through that, to make this point a little better. So if you take a mouse and you give them Xenda 9 the GLP-1 antagonist, and you give them an IP glucose tolerance test, that is, you don't change plasma GLP-1, you make these animals glucose intolerant. This doesn't happen if you don't have a GLP-1 receptor. All right, so that makes sense. Xenda 9 seems to need a GLP-1 receptor to have any effect. So we did a different experiment. We said, what if we took mice that don't make proglucagon? So they don't make any ligand for the GLP-1 receptor, no GLP-1. Again, here's the control. You give them Xenda 9, and they get glucose intolerant. These proglucagon knockouts don't respond either. Now, they have much better glucose tolerance, because when you knock out proglucagon, you knock out glucagon. So we went one step further. Again, here's the control. You give them Xenda 9, you get the GLP-1 effect. They get glucose intolerant. No proglucagon, no extended 9 effect. Now we reactivated proglucagon only in the pancreas. Uh, and in that case, we brought back the effect. So again, the inference from this study is you need proglucagon peptides, essentially GLP-1, in the islet for uh, this blockade effect to happen. And again, I think this is fairly consistent with a, a paracrine action uh, of, of GLP-1. So I've, I've damned GLP-1 as a, as a hormone. I've suggested a couple of alternatives. I'll tell you how, how we're approaching some of those alternatives. But I think there is a setting where you could argue that GLP-1 uh, is a hormone. And uh, that setting is bariatric surgery. So one of the features that's commonly recognized when uh, uh, an obese patient has a, bar a gastric bypass or a sleeve gastrectomy is all of a sudden, instead of secreting these piddly little amounts of GLP-1, the levels are very high. 15, 20-fold higher. These people just have enormous GLP-1 responses. And it probably has something to do with when you do these surgeries, nutrients just flush through the gut really quick and cause this stimulation. Um, so again, we did our trick with the CLAMP study in the meal in a group of subjects with and without a gastric bypass. And you can see here the gastric bypass, people have this enormous and rapid st uh, secretion of insulin after their meal compared to a control group. And when we block GLP-1 in these guys, we just knock the hell out of insulin secretion compared to the controls. Uh, so that the high GLP-1 in the circulation here is actually associated with a really big GLP-1 effect. And other groups have done similar studies. So this, this looks to be true. You at least have concordance of circulating GLP-1 and GLP-1 effects. Um, now, it turns out that somewhere between 1% and 5% of people that have a gastric bypass have at some later time, two or three years out, hypoglycemia. They lose weight, everything's good for a while, and then they notice every time they eat, they feel crummy, and they start measuring their blood sugar, and it's 50, 40, 30. Um, so the hypoglycemic syndrome associated with gastric bypass is well known. You ask a bariatric surgeon, it's, he says, ah, happens like once in a million. You ask an endocrinologist, he says, well, every other person seems to get this syndrome, because they all end up in our office. Um, <clears throat> but... We thought this was a good model to study circulating GLP-1. So we got 10 subjects with unequivocal hypoglycemia. These were people that had measured blood sugars less than 50, had symptoms, you know, may have had a medical consequence of this or a car accident. These were the real deal. We took 10 other subjects that were matched for age, gender, and the time from the surgery, but had no symptoms we could construe as hypoglycemic. And then we took a group of age, uh, gender and weight matched controls. And we gave them a, a meal tolerance test. We had them drink some Ensure. And you can see here the hypoglycemic subjects 
all did the same thing. They all bottomed out their blood sugar. They all had uh, uh, adrenergic and neuroglycopenic effects. And the non-symptomatic people, none of them had any symptoms at all, and their blood sugars were normal. So we brought them back, and we blocked GLP-1. We figured these guys have humongous GLP-1 levels. Maybe that's what's causing hypoglycemia. And when we infused the symptomatics with Xenda 9, none of them had hypoglycemia. None of them, it was a perfect 10 out of 10. Everybody did fine. Whereas the effects in these other groups was there, it was measurable, but it was modest and, it, and neither the controls of the asymptomatics. So it looked like this group selectively had a big GLP-1 effect that was causing a clinical syndrome. Now, I can't tell you for sure that that shows that GLP-1 is a hormone because it could be, the, could be these people are sensitive to paracrine mediation or something like that. But the story makes, makes sense and it, it's fairly consistent. Now, the, the thing that was bothersome is that the group that had um, hypoglycemia didn't really have different GLP-1 levels than the asymptomatic group. They were really the same. And we did this in up to 50 patients, so we were pretty sure about that. Well, so if you're having a bigger GLP-1 effect, but you don't have different levels of GLP-1, how can you explain that? Well, the one thought is sensitivity to GLP-1 may vary in people. We, we always take it just sort of for granted that you know, you get a stimulatory hormone and it's going to stimulate in everybody. But we know that there's a lot of variation in people. And we, we stumbled across this, again, just doing another study where we raised blood sugar and then gave a graded infusion of GLP-1, starting very low and then moving up to higher doses. And we could then calculate GLP-1 sensitivity. So insulin secretion plotted against time or here against GLP-1 levels. And you can see that it moves up like this so that there is a positive slope. But you can calculate for every individual sensitivity, and this is what we got. So this is a group of mostly people less than 25, all healthy, no abnormal glucose. And some of them are, respond very minimally to GLP-1, and some of them respond like gangbusters. And overall, there's about a tenfold difference in GLP-1 sensitivity. So again, we, we are testing this now in the bypass patients to see if the Symptomatic people actually are, are these people, more sensitive, and the asymptomatics are these people. On the other hand, you can take these studies and say, geez, if that's what's available in the normal population, maybe this has some impact on therapy. That is, if type 2 diabetic patients come into the clinic, have this range of GLP-1 sensitivity, it would be nice to be able to figure that out because you wouldn't want to give these guys a GLP-1 drug, but it might be something you'd really want to give these guys. And so that's another... Um, uh, area that, that, that we're going to try and pursue. So let me summarize what I've said this morning uh, and talk a little bit about implications. So GLP-1 is essential for normal glucose tolerance. We, we arrived at that early. But the physiologic mechanism of action, I think, is still unclear uh, and, and is not easily explained by uh, a hormonal or endocrine action. Patients with gastric bypass do have really high GLP-1 levels, and GLP may be a hormone in them. But GLP-1 sensitivity varies and must be considered when we, when we um, uh, talk about GLP-1 action. So given that I've told you this successful bench-to-bedside story and big pharma's making billions on GLP-1 drugs and lots of patients are getting them, many of them are happy with them, why bother to pursue this? Why shouldn't we go after some other gut hormone? Well, this is a, st a clinical study that, that shows the power of these GLP-1 drugs. These are poorly controlled type 2 diabetic subjects with A1Cs of 9, right? This is the kind that, that the, any doc really hates to see. Your diabetes is now a problem. 9 is, is an average blood sugar over 200, and those people are frequently symptomatic and they're at risk. So you can randomize these people to insulin or to a GLP drug, in this case, loraglutide, and you get this bang-up effect. You drop the A1C from uncontrolled to about 7, which is the standard target. And one shot of insulin, one shot of GLP, didn't matter. They both work really well, all right? Um, so this looks like this is the bench-to-bedside success I was talking to you about. On the other hand, those early studies I showed where we hooked people up to IVs of GLP-1, we didn't just make them better diabetics. We made them normal, right? You could normalize fasting and postprandial glucose in a diabetic subject by uh, interacting with the GLP-1 system. So my argument is that we have drugs that work through the, on this system, but we're not getting the maximal effect. And partly it's because the doses we use 
start to have side effects. You can only use so much GLP-1 and people will get nauseated. Whereas we never found a level of insulin, uh, a level that where the insulin secretion plateaus. So I think that more work, particularly understanding the key populations of GLP-1 receptors, is essential for trying to maximize what looks like a pretty good drug class. And again, this just shows you those early studies. So here's diabetic subjects with a blood sugar at 220. They stay over 200 if you give them saline. You hook them to GLP-1, they get much better, and they finish at around 90. So um, I think the, the, uh, the, the promise is there uh, uh, that this is still a, a drug system that, that uh, can be maximized. So in, in closing, I do want to stop and uh, uh, thank the organizers again for having me here. I'd like to acknowledge that my father's here. Uh, he drove all over the Midwest when I was young uh, watching me play ball. This is the first talk he's been to. Uh, <laughs> it's always more fun to play when your dad's there. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Dr. D'Alessio. We have a few minutes for questions. I'll ask you to call on the audience and, and please uh, repeat the questions. Okay, do it. Please in the back. No. So those early studies, oh, so the, the question here is, in the, in the early studies that I refer to as the British medical student studies, when they gave GLP-1 and saw, they gave a, a big dose. They, I mean, we weren't sure what the plasma dose is. That was a proof of concept, give a big dose. And most of the early studies were done that way. All these miracle studies where you normalize blood sugar are done at supraphysiologic doses of GLP-1. So it's pharmacology that we're talking about. When we do our dose response studies, we can't even see insulin secretion start to change until the GLP-1 levels get above the physiologic range. And again, to our way of thinking, that talks about the plasma levels we measure as elevated aren't really that effective. Does that, that get at the question? No, that, that's possible. I think in, it, unlikely in that experiment where we did everything with intravenous infusion and, and so the, other, the antagonizing or anti incredents if they come from the gut, may not have been stimulated. I mean, I think it's plausible and people are talking about that, that as, a, uh, uh, as a mechanism. Um, I think what's interesting to think about is, you know, we, we've been very simplistic about how we think of, of beta cell function, that it's glucose sensitivity, and oh yeah, it's one or two of these other factors. I think, I think it's going to end up being much more complex, and it's going to be how all these different stimulatory factors work together. I think that it may be possible that you're a low GLP responder, but a high GIP responder. Moreover, I think that all the cells in the islet are going to work as a microorgan to tune, tune up insulin secretion. I mean, I think like Don Davis, Davis's studies here and a lot of people around the, uh, the world are starting to think of the, of the islet as an organ rather than as a, a sort of an endpoint for stimuli. And I think how those factors work together is going to be, um, going to be very interesting. Yeah. Other questions? Don? Yeah. Well, so that's a really good question. So, so Dr. Davis asks about the, you know, if we're limited in the good effects, stimulating insulin secretion, by the bad effects, stimulating nausea, and we are, um, can you tease those two apart? And I, I think that's a great idea, and it, I think it's something that's, that, that's very important. The nausea centers in the brain are that same hindbrain area where I showed you in the rats, GLP activates. And the, there, you know, it's debated whether the nausea center is connected, overlapped, or distinct from the satiety center, but they're very close together. Um, and, and so that seems to be a neural, that, that again is an argument for neural mediation of GLP-1 action, that you, you can activate the brain with peripheral GLP-1. The question is, do the GLP-1 receptors on the nausea neurons 
respond the same way as the beta cells, or could you tease them apart in some way? And, and we do. One of the guys in the lab now, I was mentioned, is, is starting to look at downstream signaling from the GLP-1 receptor, and can he, can he distinguish the pathways in the brain? Are they different or the same in the beta cell? And he's got some very interesting uh, data that suggests that um, arrest in action uh, amplifies GLP-1 signaling in the brain, but not the islet. And that it's possible then that you could make biased GLP-1 agonists that, that don't act through arrest and that would give you a beta cell effect with less nausea. So I, I, that's very early work, but I, I throw it out there as an example of how the system could be tweaked to make more effective therapeutics. Okay, thanks very much. No further questions. I want to thank Dr. Delesio.